Welcome to the second, third, and technically eighth Digimon games made for the Wonderswine. Digimon Anode and Cathode Tamer. Unlike the previous game, which focused more on the virtual pet aspects, these are tactical RPGs more in the vein of something like Final Fantasy Tactics. You command a squad of Digimon against an enemy squad of Digimon and move them on a grid to attack the enemy. Also unlike the previous game, these games actually have a plotline. You play as Re- <clears throat> Before I get into describing the plot, it's worth mentioning that this game came out around the time Digimon Adventure was airing for the first time in Japan. As a result of that, a good chunk of the supporting cast is from Adventure. This game, and the three direct sequels it would have, would come to be known as the Wonderswan series by fans, though I'll refer to them as the Ryo Quadrilogy. This is because they all focus around the same protagonist, Ryo Akiyama, or Akiyama Ryo if you're Japanese. Funnily enough, actually fitting these games into the anime's timeline is something of a nightmare, because Ryo's existence in canon is, shall we say, convoluted? But he's also canon to Adventure 02 in Tamers, I guess? Who Ryo is and where he came from has never really been properly explained or established, and doing that for this video, or this series for that matter, would be well outside the scope of what I want to talk about, so let's just make this simple, shall we? Before we get started, I should also say that most of the information here comes from the wonderful resource Yesterday, made and ran by Ajora Fravashi. I'll be deferring to her information and translations for most of the videos that focus on Ryo, like this one does. Anyway, the game starts on New Year's Eve, 1999. We follow Ryo Akiyama, just a normal Japanese kid living in the suburbs of Japan. He's typing away in a chat room on a laptop his father bought both of them for Christmas. They talk about an earthquake that happened during the events of Adventure 01, and one of the people mentions Taichi, the leader of the Chosen Children from Digimon. As if on cue, the power goes out, and Ryo is promptly devastated because he can't spend the rest of the night on Discord. Then, a dinosaur appears on his screen and starts talking to him even though the power went out. Although considering this is a laptop, it should still have some battery life, but I'd personally be more concerned about the dinosaur talking to me in perfect English. Uh, Japanese, we'll get to that. Anyways, the dinosaur is named Agumon, and he says that everyone has been captured. Then, a strange device appears on screen, and the magical talking dinosaur pleads with Ryo to touch it. Since Ryo is a kid and therefore a dumbass, he decides to trust the magical talking dinosaur and touches the strange object, and the predictable happens. Ryo wakes up in a strange land with a dinosaur standing in front of him. Naturally, Ryo, having woken up to a talking dinosaur, is convinced this is all a dream. Agumon tries to explain the entire plot of Adventure 01 to Ryo in roughly 10 seconds, and that only makes Ryo more confused. He also gives Ryo crap for spending so much time on the computer he was supposed to share with his dad. Agumon throws out a bunch of names that mean nothing to Ryo, and Ryo gets understandably frustrated, and then depending on the version, either a tsunami or an earthquake happens, opening up the ground and sending Ryo and Agumon tumbling into the abyss below. After making sure they're both okay, Agumon tries once again to explain stuff to Ryo, but since Agumon is also a dumbass, they get nowhere. Ryo is still convinced this is a dream, when out of nowhere a monster attacks Ryo, and the pain makes him realize that this is not a dream, but is actually very real. Agumon steps in front of Ryo and says he'll protect him, and after making short work of the monster, Agumon... Gotcha. Gotcha. I bet you thought the whole game was gonna be in black and white and Japanese like this, huh? Fortunately, there was an English remake of this game released exclusively in Hong Kong a year and a half later. In full color, no less. Digimon Anode slash Cathode Tamer Vidramon version. Yes, that's actually what it's called. As shoddy as the translation can be at times, this is still unquestionably the best way to play the game, and it'll be the source of my footage going forward. This version features color graphics, improved artwork, access to both versions of the game, and inexplicably, a rendition of the American Digimon theme. The Japanese version uses a rendition of Braveheart, and I vastly prefer it, but aside from that, the color version is superior. Aside from a few minor visual glitches here and there, and a gameplay issue I'll talk about later. The game's engine seems to be based on Cathode Tamer, which had quite a few improvements to the sprite work. I mean, look at Anode's title screen, and then look at the color version's title screen, which is based off of Cathode Tamer's. The Anode version has the Digimon looking wrong. They look really janky. Ugh, Gabumon, what did they do to you? Where were we with the plot? Oh yeah. Ryo's screwing around on his dad's computer, the power goes out, Agumon talks to him, Ryo touches the Digivice, gets transported to the digital world, Agumon can't explain for crap, crisis happens, and then the big fat meanie attacks, and Agumon defeats it. There, I think we're about caught up. 
Having defended Ryo, Agumon takes him to a place called File Island to meet a mysterious old man who claims to be both human and also not human simultaneously, because that makes sense. He also makes fun of Agumon for being crap at explaining things, just in case you think I decided to give Agumon a hard time for no reason. So the basic gist of the plot is, the plot of adventure happened, and the chosen children overcame strong enemies, yada yada, but apparently at some unspecified point in time, they fought a Chimeramon and a Mugendramon. What makes this really confusing is that a Chimeramon is later fought in Adventure 02's anime, but it's not the same one referred to here. You never actually see or hear anybody mention this fight in the anime or these games to my knowledge. Also, for the longest time, I assumed the Mugendramon referred to here was from Adventure, and considering how he wound up getting defeated... Oh, yeah! Yeah, you can't exactly lick your wounds when your body's been torn to shrapnel! So the aforementioned Chimeramon and Mugendramon have nothing to do with Adventure's plotline, and were created for the sole purpose of giving Ryo a final boss to fight. And that final boss is Millennium on because the year 2000 was all the rage in 1999. Millenniumon is a fusion of Chimeramon and Mugendramon, and he has the power to manipulate time. And through this power, he has resurrected the evil Digimon that were defeated over the course of adventure, and had them take all the chosen children hostage. Naturally, since they're all out of commission, Agumon just went across every computer he could find until he found someone who would actually listen to his inane ramblings. And Ryo just so happened to be that someone. It's funny, this whole situation is basically a wrong man in the right place kind of deal. So it's up to you, as Ryo, to rescue the chosen children and slowly gain power and allies until you're strong enough to face the Time Lord himself. And with that, you're given a pat on the back and pointed in the direction of the first set of baddies. So you look around File Island to see what there is to do, but unfortunately, you very quickly come to the conclusion that everyone on File Island also can't explain anything for crap. Sometimes literally. If you walk, you really want to go doo-doo, do you? You know, right, that if you don't go doo-doo, you get hungry more easily. What the fuck? What's supposed to happen is that you're supposed to go into a dungeon, clear it of all the enemy Digimon there, and then talk to everyone around File Island for advice. But the problem is, most of this advice is either so vague as to be useless, so basic that even a six-year-old could grasp it without being told about it in the first place, or so poorly translated that you can barely understand what they're trying to tell you! You have your obligatory stuff like training arenas and stuff like that, but the real meat of the game is clearing out the dungeons and fighting in them, naturally. There's also a bunch of stuff that lets you connect back to Digimon Virgin Wonderswan, but since I'm once again playing on an emulator, those will forever be a mystery to you and I, unfortunately. Oh yeah, the gameplay. I guess it should go into that, shouldn't I? Transaction cancelled. So as I mentioned at the start, this game is a squad-based tactical RPG where you fight the enemy group of Digimon with your group of Digimon. Like in the last game, the later a Digimon's evolutionary stage, the more powerful and slow it is. But in this game, a few things have been done to add some variety. For example, each Digimon is a field type. There are three fields, land, ocean, and sky. Each Digimon that corresponds to each field type gets an advantage when they're on a tile of that field. So if a sky Digimon is fighting land Digimon on the clouds or in the mountains, that Digimon does more damage and takes less damage. If an ocean Digimon is fighting a land Digimon on dry land, the ocean Digimon does less damage and takes more damage. Also, Digimon can't evolve in this game. Instead, they use something called variables, which are essentially what other JRPGs call spells or summons. Using these, Digimon can temporarily evolve and use a technique that can do anything from attack enemies on the field, to buffing stats, to healing its allies. This is the only way you can use a ranged attack, by the way. As a result of all this, these games feel quite different from what came before and what'll come after. Unfortunately, as much as it pains me to say this, this is not a good thing. Because of the field types, most battles often come down to tricking your enemy into getting onto terrain that they're at a disadvantage on. And for some inexplicable reason, the virtual pet elements from the previous game are back! That's right, as you play the game, each of your Digimon is a hunger meter that is constantly ticking down. This means at random points in any given fight, your Digimon will stop fighting at their best because they're hungry or they need to take a shit. So you have to dedicate space in your inventory for food to feed your Digimon, and you have to let them waste a turn eating or using the toilet. Your Digimon can literally be attacked while they're taking a dump. What is this game? And these meters really are constantly ticking down, and there's nothing you can do to turn this off. Even while you're talking in the overworld, your Digimon's stomach is empty and their bowels are filling. Of all the games that I wanted f 
fucking survival game mechanics in, Digimon was not one of them. Ah! So after clearing the first dungeon full of very easy to defeat Digimon, you're told that your Digivice can actually be used to recruit other Digimon. All you have to do is get enough points and then point it at whatever Digimon you want to recruit. This is also a mess because the stronger a Digimon is, the more points it requires, and if you successfully capture a Digimon, your point total is set to zero, which means you have to spend a ton of time fighting to get your points to go back up, so it takes forever to recruit new Digimon, especially the strong ones. And now let's talk about that gameplay issue the remake has. Every time you clear a dungeon, you're given a Digimon as a reward. It's always the same Digimon when you clear a dungeon. Well, in this game, you're given Vidramon for clearing the first very easy dungeon. The problem is Vidramon is totally busted. Vidramon is more powerful than even endgame bosses, and you can get a full team of three of them and just bulldoze your way through an already easy game. It'd be like in Pokemon if you were just given six Mewtwo's at the start of the... Oh, bad example. In the originals, you received Coromon and Tyranomon every time you defeated the first dungeon, and they're a lot more reasonable for where you are at the start of the game. You have a fast, fragile Digimon and a slow, tanky Digimon, and they complement each other quite well. Vidramon was given out at events. It was supposed to be something only a few people got, but they stopped doing the events, so they made them easily accessible here. God, remember events? Remember when people actually went outside and they weren't afraid for their lives? Remember when there wasn't a pandemic that was killing people? Remember when you could go outside and not have to wear a- <laughs> You're no match for me with my power restored. Let me do it. I'll show you my true power. So you defeat Devimon and save some of the chosen children, and I already have a big problem with this. This game stumbles into the same pitfall a lot of licensed superhero games and stuff like that fall into. You're this person that helps out the recognizable cast members and beats the villains that belong to their rogues gallery, and they congratulate you and tell you how they couldn't have done it without you, and it all just feels very patronizing. None of these enemies are really Rio's enemies, not even Millennium on. Millennium just wants revenge for what the Chosen Children did to him off screen. Ryo doesn't even have anything to do with Millenniumon's plot, other than being that random kid that answered Agumon's call for help. So after you get rid of the main threats on File Island, you go to the Continent of Darkness. But all it really means is more enemies to fight that are a little stronger. Oh yeah, and the old man berates the people that live on the island for being idiots, because he's an asshole. Speaking of the Chosen Children, every time you beat one of the main antagonists from Adventure, a few of the Chosen Children lend you their Digimon to help on your adventure. Unfortunately, with the exception of Agumon and Tailmon, they're all largely outclassed by other Digimon you can find in dungeons. Their stats are fine, but the variables they learn are pretty much useless because they use a type system that's never properly explained. For example, Palmon and her variables do increase damage to plant Digimon, but what is a plant Digimon? I don't know. The game's not gonna tell you, so you just have to guess. In that case, why not just pick something that does more damage to everything? My personal strategy is to just buff my Digimon's defensive stats and win through attrition, but this reveals a bigger problem with the battles in this game. Pacing. Variables bring the already sluggish pace of battles in these games to a screeching halt. The animations for variables last way too long, and there's no way to make them shorter. There's also no way to shorten or skip regular battle animations either. This leads to every battle becoming a slog as the game goes on, because you do need to use variables to defeat your enemies, and even if you didn't, your enemy has no problem spamming them with impunity. Here's how long it takes for a typical variable to be executed in real time. They're fun to watch the first few times, but they very quickly become tedious, and it just starts to feel like padding for a game that really isn't all that long to begin with. Hmph! <laughs> what a stuck up kid. I'll break all of you into little pieces! So let's really quickly talk about the bosses, since I haven't really gone over them. They follow a pretty similar formula. Usually they have a unique variable or something similar to distinguish them, but they're really not all that challenging in spite of that. I use one strategy throughout the whole game, and I pretty consistently won, basically every time. 
My strategy is to use the Monzaimon variable, which buffs your defense, and keep using that until you take barely any damage at all from enemy attacks. And some of the enemies towards the end, especially Millenniumon, are so powerful that even after casting Monzaimon like three or four times, I still take a huge chunk of damage. And outside of that, the bosses really aren't that noteworthy. Edamon here is probably the standout one because he decides to fight you by himself, and even when you beat him... You, I tried to be nice to you and this is how you repay me? How about I make you pay? <laughs> I ain't gonna take shame like this. Come and get him, boys! So you just have a standard three-on-three -three brawl, so there's not really anything special about him. Honestly, you could take any one boss, swap him out for any other boss, and aside from a few minor exceptions, you'd be fighting the same enemy. And that's just kind of sad, because usually boss fights are supposed to be, you know, fun, entertaining, special. But not here. Anyway, you free more chosen children, and their Digimon kind of suck, and you get closer to defeating the big bad, and you've heard this before. So, you hear about Anode and Cathode, and you're wondering, what does that even mean? What are Anodes and Cathodes exactly? If you're you, if you're like the older generation like I am, you probably have heard of Cathode Ray Tubes, like in televisions and whatnot, but basically, it comes down to, um, hold on, electrons, right? This is an electrical engineering thing. And they're based on the, the directions in which electrons and the electrical charges that come with them flow in and out of anything, really. But batteries are a great example. Like, okay, forgive the really rough diagram, but like basically, an anode, an anode is where electricity flows out, like this. And a cathode is where electricity flows in, like this. Yeah. So... Um, that, that's a super simplified explanation of it, and there's a lot more I could go into, but for the purposes of this video, that's all you really need to know. For example, cathode ray tube televisions, like, dog, cathode ray tube televisions, ah, oh, god, what a mess, cathode ray tube televisions, that's a horrible, hideous drawing, um, they work from, by having an electron gun in the back of the thing, have light bounce left and right, bounce inside the television until you see an image on the screen, and that's cathodes, like, that is cathode, that's cathodes, um, doing stuff with light, and, okay, basically, like I said, it all comes down to one thing, <laughs> hold on, hold on. It comes down to this. <laughs> What's funny to me is I guess the two versions thing that Pokemon does really did not work out that well for Bandai because after Anode and Cathode, Bandai would not try the whole two versions of the same game thing again for another seven years with Digimon World Dawn and Digimon World Dusk. And I guess that one didn't do too well either because they would never repeat that stunt again. You know, when Pokemon does that, typically there's a reason to buy the other version, like exclusive Pokemon and sometimes exclusive content. But in Digimon Anode and Cathode Tamer, the only differences are what Digimon you can obtain, a few minor flavor differences, and what the second to last boss is. It's Mugendramon and Anode Tamer, and Chimeramon and Cathode Tamer. Cathode's Digimon roster tends to lean more towards Ocean Digimon, and Anode's roster tends to lean more towards Land Digimon. That's about it, really. Every game from this point onward, with the exception of Battle Spirit 1, is its own self-contained experience. No other games required. So they're much more traditional RPGs, because apparently, Pokemon can get away with that, but nobody else can. <laughs> huh? You thought you won, did you? I'm going to have your head served up on a platter to my master Millennium Mom. Why don't you come? I'll show you the difference in power! Anyways, more Digimon! You're the best person ever, even though nobody knows who you are! You also get Tailmon, and she is just awesome! She can stomp so many different kinds of ass, and she's durable as all hell! She's very tanky, reasonably fast, and has lots of variable points! Oh yeah, I didn't talk about variables, did I? 
In order to actually obtain variables, you have to have very specific team loadouts, and then you have a random chance of unlocking certain variables. It depends on what three Digimon you have in your team. Some of them are really hard to unlock, like Monzaimon, for example. You need Numemon and Nanimon to unlock Monzaimon. What really sucks is that the older a Digimon is, the harder it is for it to learn variables. And since variables require variable points to use, and the older a Digimon is, the more variable points it has, it means the Digimon you actually want to teach these variables will take forever to teach them to. In fact, I spent several hours grinding up my final team for the final boss, and it would have been so much easier if they just learned variables at a reasonable time frame. Honestly, this whole video took a really long time to make. I had initially planned to have this out on New Year's Eve, and a week before that for anyone who's a patron, but... The weather was not exactly agreeable. I wanted to get it out in January, but then... Oh. Oh. Oh, oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Oh, oh, go oh, God, politics! Oh, no, politics! Guess what? America showed up! And you opened the fucking doors for them. You opened the doors for them. Oh, God, politics! Uh, uh, YouTube mandated corporate sponsorship time! Who doesn't want a nice, refreshing Coke? <laughs> you're very powerful, and it does seem that you're a chosen child, but your streak ends here. My name is Paimon. Under Master Millenniumon's power, I have returned. I refuse to let you go any further. This place is going to be your graveyard. Come on if you dare! So in a rather uncharacteristic moment of cheapness, the game just boots you out of the dungeon, rocks fall, and now Millenniumon's ready to fight you. No one comments on it, there's no cutscene slides, nothing. You're just ready to fight the final boss. It's a little out of place because there were these really well sprited um, cutscene slides after you defeat every major boss, but after Paimon you get this little in-game thing and it just feels really rushed and cheap. If you think this means you can just go ahead and fight Millenniumon, you're wrong though. You need to make sure your variable loadout is finalized, you have as many healing items and food items as possible, and your team is as strong as possible. So you'll probably need to do some grinding because credit where credit's due. Even though this is a game predominantly targeted towards children, Millennium On is not a pushover. So you make it to the moon castle lair of the final boss Millennium On. Lots of ninjas on the moon base. And in true video game tradition, the final dungeon consists of a gauntlet of all the previous bosses fought one after another. So you need to make sure you have plenty of healing and ways to heal yourself because you're in this for the long haul. I think there's like 12 battles here. It's a lot. Anyways, you defeat every boss that you fought before and really they're not any stronger than they were before. It's one of those things where you kind of feel like you're doing a victory lap, but also you're kind of struggling because they are strong, but you're stronger if you know what you're doing. So you make it through all these bosses and you're confronted by Millenniumon in one of his previous forms. So once you defeat Mugendramon or Chimeramon, Millenniumon's finally had enough and he decides to transform into his real form to fight you for real. <laughs> I guess I'll have to show my true power. I'll show you the true meaning of fear. I'll blast, blast you from, from here, here to, to kingdom, kingdom come! Here's something you might not know about Millennium On. He has one of the most criminally underrated final boss themes in video game history. Listen to that! So the strategy of Millennium Mod is the same as it is with everyone else. Buff your defense or buff your offense. Buff yourself like crazy. Give yourself every advantage you can and do not attack Millennium Mod until you are as buffed out as possible. Because to say Millennium Mod hits like a truck is an understatement. Millennium Mod hits more like a nuclear bomb. He can do over 200 damage in a single attack. So he is not a joke, even with several defense buffs. Because even with several defense buffs, Millennium Mon was routinely taking 50 to 75 health away from my Digimon. So you defeat Millennium Mon, and then the Chosen Children are all free. Agumon's reunited with Taichi, and, and it all it's all real emotional and real sweet. 
and the game tells you, oh no, you have to leave now, and I wish I could care. The real problem this game has is it doesn't show you or make you experience becoming friends with any of these Digimon or people. You're just told to feel that way. You don't really form a bond with any of these characters, so it all rings pretty hollow. It's very shallow and superficial. They're like, oh, we'll never forget you, Ryo, but the thing is, outside of defeating all those Digimon and freeing the Chosen Children, they barely interact with you at all, so it all feels very forced. And then you have Ryo returning to the real world, and his parents are like, oh, Ryo, where'd you go? Oh, you look so mature now. Let's go celebrate the new year, Ryo, and I'm just like, ugh. It just doesn't feel earned. It feels very, it feels very one note and flat. Honestly, these games are not as good as I remember them being. <laughs> like, they have lots of pacing problems. I praise these games for having a plot when version Wonderswan didn't, but in all brutal honesty, the plot is paper thin and barely there. It's just an excuse to go fight Digimon. It's not really much of a plot at all, and Ryo's not much of a character either. He's just a person that does things. And I guess the writing team must have agreed with me because every game from this point onwards will not only give Ryo and Millennium on way more characterization, but will have you actually interact with the chosen children outside of just saving them. And, you know, just have an actual story in my role-playing game. I know, right? A story instead of just a series of events happening that barely mean anything. It's just frustrating. And the gameplay is shallow, the tactical stuff Honestly, is it really all that great? The later games are much more fun because they're a lot more streamlined and a lot more fun and things are actually explained to you. Not only that, you can evolve your Digimon. This just feels really rough. I honestly question why Bandai thought remastering this was necessary at all. That being said, it does hold a special place in my heart as one of the first Digimon games I've ever played. And, I mean, it's got some charm. It's a decent game. It's just, the problem is, Decent is being generous. It is at best serviceable and it could have been so much more and what came after proves that I'm right because it is so much more It's way better, but unfortunately We're not going to talk about that next We're going to talk about whatever this fucking thing is Thanks for joining me on this installment of Digimon Wonderswan Anthology. If you enjoyed the video, consider liking, commenting, and subscribing. If you want to see these videos earlier and have me produce them more consistently, consider supporting me on Patreon. But until then, I hope to see you next time. So you're probably wondering if there's a post-game. There is! I just didn't really talk about it because there's nothing particularly special about it. There's two extra dungeons that have most of the same Digimon you fought before, with a few new items that let you permanently change your stats, but since you've beaten the game, it's largely a moot point. There's also supposedly a third dungeon that lets you capture the bosses, but I could not for the life of me get it to unlock. I don't know if my emulator is broken, or if the game itself is broken, because you're supposed to play for like 20 hours straight, and I just left the game on for like 3 or 4 days straight and just stood there, I don't know if the game wants me to constantly be playing it for like 20 hours, in which case, screw that. Or if my emulator, BizHawk, does not keep track of time, but I could not get it to work. The fourth final dungeon was event exclusive, and those events are about 20 years out of date, so that's just not happening. It's really frustrating, because I really like the boss's designs, but, you know, what can you do? You're just giving this bullcrap about being able to do whatever you want, but you've pretty much seen everything the game has to offer, all you fight are stronger versions of the same Digimon, so it's just a waste. Why even bother with a post-game? It just feels tacked on.
total cost. <laughs>